welcome back for another episode of Conversations at the Intersection of Cutting Edge Science and Spirituality. I'm Jennifer K. Hill here with you today with Dr. Deepak Chopra and Professor Don Hoffman as we continue to explore the new scientist article that Deepak Chopra introduced us to. And over the course of these episodes, we've been exploring things such as inductive learning and can evolution learn. In the last episode, if you were able to join us, we explored the idea of the selfish gene. Some of my favorite takeaways from the last episode that we did were Deepak's idea that the biosphere does not give rise to life, but rather life gives rise to the biosphere. And then Don, of course, shocked us all when he said that the theory of evolution uh, basically states that space-time is not fundamental. And I think all of our minds were a little bit blown by that. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about adapt first, mutate later, which is the next section in this new scientist article. So I'd like to begin today by sharing with you a little bit about uh, one of the examples that they give in this article of the Mexican spadefoot toad. In this example, you have Mexican spadefoot toads who basically emerge uh, from ponds in a post-monsoon season. Now, most of the time, these Mexican spadefoot toads, they survive on algae and bacteria. However, if they find themselves in a pond that happens to be filled with fairy shrimp, then the Mexican spadefoot toads in that generation, not inherited from their parents, but in that specific instance, adapt to have larger jaws and shorter guts. So why does that matter to us? Why are we talking about this? And how is this relevant to us as human beings who are clearly not Mexican spadefoot toads? I wanted to tie that into what we're experiencing right now around the world and globally. We are going through climate change, environmental changes, we're going through psychological, physiological changes, and this all ties into how evolution impacts us as human beings and plasticity-led evolution. So I thought today, Deepak, that maybe we would start the last few episodes we've been focused on science to begin. And today I thought it might be interesting to begin with you, Deepak, and your thoughts on what it means as we evolve as spiritual human beings, given the environmental factors we're all faced with right now, whether we're talking about the increases in temperature around the globe, whether we're talking about the way that we've evolved as human beings. I know your perspective is holistic in nature, the whole body phenomenon, Deepak. So if you could share with us your perspective on adapting from a spiritual standpoint and what all of these changes mean for us as human beings, and then we can go over to Don on his thoughts. Sure. So adapt first, mutate lead later is the headline in that article. And the question then arises, who or what adapts? Mm. And the example that I was given here is that of a particular species that adapts because it has to survive. So it, uh, it adapts to a new environment, its biology shifts. And of course, the shifting of the biological organism is a result of gene expression. Mm -hmm. But then you ask yourself, what is it that adapts? And of course, the usual answer is the biological organism that's adapting. But I think if we take a consciousness-based approach, adapt, adaptation can only occur in awareness. Adaptation can only occur in consciousness. So I feel that if you look deeper, you'll see two, two kinds of adaptation, or maybe one kind. The adaptation is not that of a single organism, but all of the whole biosphere, which contains the biological organism and what we call the, you know, the environment. But they're the same, biosphere of the body, biosphere of the atmosphere, or the world, or the planet is the same, you know that the earth is recycling as our body, uh, most of our body is space, the atoms in our body came from star stuff, uh, the rivers and waters are uh, recycling as our circulation, the air is our breath. So, you know, we say this is a biological organism, that's the environment, but in spiritual traditions, it's one whole ecosystem. The biological organism is an ecosystem, 
and what we call the biosphere or the environment or the extended body is also an ecosystem and they're correlated. So let me give you a few examples uh, of what I think we could understand as what in Buddhism and Eastern wisdom traditions is called interdependent co-arising. So I happened to be in Florida and you know, I was at uh, actually a, a retreat in an ashram and uh, now I'm at another location similar. But in Florida, there's a, a, there's a development called uh, Restoring the Panther's Path. So the panther, the Florida panther is an endangered species. And about three, four, five years ago, I don't know, uh, about five years plus ago, there was a project to restore the path of the panther. You know, and how was that done? First, by ensuring that the, the panthers weren't being killed by road accidents, by hunters, etc. So they could recycle, you know, they could reproduce. Um, there were maybe 10 or 15, I don't know how many panthers left, but short story, the environment and everything was made supportive for the survival of the panther and its reproduction. So from a small number, we have now a huge uh, belt in Florida, which is called the Panther's Path. What happened very interestingly is that when the Panther's Path was restored, all the other species got resurrected. There were more birds, there were more bees, there was more flora, there was more fauna, and species that were disappearing, certain returned giving rise to the deeper understanding that evolution of species is an interdependent co-arising. Mm -hmm. that, that, that evolution is actually happening systemically, not each organism at a time. Now that in my mind, that entanglement is both local and non-local. Okay, so, you know, just like our body, you know, my body uh, operates, I have 50 trillion cells, they're all doing their own thing, you know, um, but each cell is correlated its activity with every other cell instantly. That's non-local correlation. My heartbeat, my moods, my fight flight responses, my rest um, responses, my parasympathetic nervous system, my sympathetic nervous system, my endocrine system, my immune system, all of these are working in a way that each cell's activity is correlated with every cell. But then there are messenger molecules that also correlate what we call their own feedback loop. So every system has a feedback loop. Endocrine system has a feedback loop, in immune system, blood pressure, bone, you know, body temperature regulation. But then these feedback loops, which may be local correlations, you know, there's a messenger molecule, there's a receptor, there's a feedback. But then the feedback loops themselves are correlated. Now that could be a non-local correlation. Now many people are also suggesting that the brain's activity, you know, what we call binding, is also correlated instantly. So there are other examples. You know, when I was researching my book, uh, Meta Human, and then also Total Meditation, you know, I found that when you look at migratory patterns of birds. You know, birds are migrating from Mexico into the US. They stop at a certain location. In that precise moment, horseshoe crabs come from the depths of the ocean. It's a full moon night. And these horseshoe crabs lay their eggs, which serve two purposes. The horseshoe crabs reproduce and the birds get their meal on their flight to Canada, all the way from Latin America or whatever. But it, the whole thing is correlated. Everything is correlated instantly. So actually this has huge implications. You know, many years ago, there was a, a, there was a hybrid uh, uh, rice produced in certain parts of India. Um, it went by various names, you know, golden rice, et cetera, et cetera. And it replaced the original rice that was part of that uh, produce in that area, which is basmati rice. If you've ever been to an Indian restaurant and you've smelt basmati rice, it's a very distinct smell. So when the hybrid rice was introduced, the rice didn't have the smell that it normally, you know, that's a very beautiful smell to human beings. But apparently it's a beautiful smell to bees as well. So when the uh, 
the, the smell was last. The bees stopped coming. When the bees stopped coming, the birds stopped coming. When the birds stopped coming, that changed the predatory uh, relationships in the ecosystem. So the ecosystem got imbalanced. That resulted in uh, actually famine in some parts of the country, uh, just the replacement of basmati rice with the other rice. And then ultimately that affected weather patterns, famine, there were strikes, um, there, were, uh, there was a, a, a dip in the stock market, there was mass migrations, there was violence. So all of that because one grain of rice switched from golden rice to whatever to, um, you know, from Basmati to golden. These are, there are many examples like this of correlations. And now today there's a movement in the world called permaculture, where actually people are looking at the evolution of systems, the entanglement of genetic information, which we call the planetary microbiome, but also the entanglement of trees. So, you know, if you infect a tree with gypsy moth, it informs all the other trees in the neighborhood. I've got gypsy moth, watch out, they all make antibodies, but that changes the entire ecosystem as well, which it reacts in its own way. Bottom line, it's entangled. Evolution, I think, is systemic and natural selection plays a role, but uh, there is, it seems, you know, and you have to be very careful when we say this because Darwinian evolution and its principles of random mutations, I would say unpredictable mutations, the difference between random and unpredictable. Random means uh, inherently random, unpredictable. I don't know what the heck is going on, these Dover, de novo mutations. So, you know, there's this, today the fashion is random mutations, natural selections. But it could be what we humans call unpredictable mutations and also natural selection guided by, and here's the ringer because now we go back to what's his name, not Darwin, but his contemporary who said, Lamarck, Lamarck that there's intention involved. A camel has a, you know, a giraffe has a long neck because it wants to reach up that tree. There's this called teleological explanations. The jury is out, but you know, if we want to reverse climate change, one of the things I'm talking to right now with the climatologists is how about restoring the human biosphere, which is right in our own body, okay? Because this is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And since like the panther, we are entangled at least in natural systems with other biological organisms. If we plant trees in the right place, if we resurrect the genetic microbiome, if we pay attention to a few species and their survival, and if we are less predatory with concrete and more uh, permaculture and trees and resurrecting the genetic microbiome, we actually theoretically could reverse climate change. So that is what I meant. Life creates the biosphere, not the biosphere. So current, uh, uh, you know, mechanistic explanations say you have to have a certain uh, constants, whether it's the electromagnetic constant, gravity, strong weak interactions, they all have to be in a certain way in order to give life or mind, you know, but that is now kind of questionable. I think if we, by life, we mean anything that is a conscious agent, anything that's a conscious agent, then it's the matrix of conscious agents that is expressing itself as the biosphere, but the body mind my body mind is part of that. It's not, it's part of the scenery. It's not, it's not, you know, when you say, who's the observer, this is part of the observed. The observer is way back somewhere, um, unmanifest altogether behind the matrix of conscious agents. What is the organizing principle in that matrix of conscious agents that we call, uh, that we call life so and ultimately the biosphere. So what is that? organizing principle, I would say consciousness, but I'd stop here. So Deepak, what I'm hearing you say, just to make sure it's clear for all of our viewers and listeners out there, is that when we do the work to heal ourselves and heal the biosphere of us as individual human beings, that healing each and every one of the seven plus billion people on the planet leads to the healing of the whole of the planet itself because of how interconnected we are and intertangled. Is that correct? Depending on critical mass. Yeah, there must be some critical mass that okay. has that common behavior 
that then results because it's not only we think how we behave how we speak this is a very interesting thing right now i'm speaking to i'm moving neurochemicals and you're moving mind with your feedback and we're moving neurochemicals everywhere in the world right now just by this conversation to some extent that could influence behavior choices permaculture god knows what it's yeah. too complex and it's funny because, Don, this ties into your book, uh, you know, basically the case against reality, why evolution hid the truth from our eyes. I was recently rereading chapter four in your book where you talk about evolutionary game theory and you give the example in the book of doves and hawks and the likelihood of in this game of doves and hawks, it's directly proportionate to what Deepak just said of how many doves, how many hawks, how many points is each one getting? So if you can share with us, you know, your perspective, Don, on the scientific theory and all of the research that you've done. I've read your papers, which were incredible on fitness beats truth. And for anybody who wants those, please comment in the comments below. And we'll be happy to provide you with those papers. I know a few people had commented in the last episode as to requesting that. So Don, can you share with us your thoughts on adapt first, mutate later, and how that plays out as you talk about even in your book about the butterfly effect? something happening here in Portugal, a butterfly's wings can create a typhoon in Hong Kong. Right. So again, as, as a scientist, um, what I do is I take our best current scientific theories and try to look at their implications, right? And our, our best current scientific theories um, may not be the final word, but they're the best word that we have that's rigorous so far. Um, and so that's the spirit in which, which I, I, I do this. And so I'm not doctrinaire about our current scientific theories. Uh, but, but on the other hand, um, I don't want to do less than really study our current scientific theories, because that's the best that humanity has so far in terms of a rigorous, precise, testable understanding of what we've found in exploring nature so far. And, and in that case, um, we, we do find that, like in the case of the hawk versus dove game, for example, that, that different strategies will have differing effects in different environments. So if everybody, so the hot dove game is, is sort of like this, suppose that there's a limited resource, mm. basmati rice. <laughs> and, and we all need basmati rice to survive. And there are, you know, as we go foraging around, there's little pots of basmati rice. And when two <laughs> both arrive at the rice, they have a little problem, right? Who gets it? And so the doves are very polite and they flip a coin and they, know, they agree that whoever wins the, the flip gets the whole pot of basmati rice. And so you, but, and, and that works out because you know that if I lose this time, chances are I'll win the next time, you know, 50-50. So I'm not gonna go hungry. It's very unlikely for me to lose 10 times in a row. You know, flips, flips of coins usually don't go that way. So that's the dove. And so there's no fighting. So you have no negative penalties for fighting and you get the positive Re result of getting resources half the time, which if there's enough basmati rice, then you'll be fine. Now the, the hawk, now, by the way, that's a really fit strategy. No one gets hurt. There's usually plenty for all. But in that situation it, for, where everybody's a dove, then the hawk strategy is, is quite fit, right? So hawk is, they, they, you know, when you meet a hawk at the basmati rice, the hawk says, I'm taking the rice and I'm taking all of it. And, and the only way I'm not gonna take it is if uh, you fight me for it. And, and so the, the doves never fight. So in that case, every time a hawk meets a dove at a basmati, the <laughs> hawk gets all of the basmati rice and the dove gets nothing. So you can see that makes it very, very fit for the hawk in terms of getting the resources. Now, so now the hawks are going to proliferate from an evolutionary point of view. The hawks will proliferate because they're getting lots of rice. But at some point, um, when hawks start meeting other hawks, because now there's more hawks around, they will fight and now they'll start getting injured. Now you're getting negative fitness points. And so when there are enough hawks around so that you're getting beat up frequently enough, all of a sudden the hawk strategy is no longer a, a good one. So you'll find, depending on the penalties for getting beat up with a hawk, there'll be a certain proportion of the um, population that will be hawks versus doves. It might be 25% hawks, 75% dove, depends on, on the payoffs. And so, so from an evolutionary point of view, 
Um, of course, you can see this is a completely amoral kind of analysis of, of the thing. It's just simply what works to, um, to you know, procreate and, and pass your genes into the next generation. So, so at, a, at a more meta level, so that's just, just so people understand the, the hawk dove game and, 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 and how evolution thinks about things. That's called frequency dependent selection. Mm -hmm. the, the effectiveness of a strategy, hawk versus dove, is not absolute. It depends on who you're competing against and how frequent the other strategies are. So if everybody's a hawk, that's going to make the hawk strategy less effective than if you're the one hawk in the middle of a bunch of doves. That's what we call frequency dependent selection. Can yeah. I ask a quick question about that, Don? Something just kind of dawned on me in the moment as you were saying that, and this is, please forgive me for the people out there that what I'm about to say, but this is just an insight that I had. Like if you were to take, for example, in the real world, not animal, but in human culture, like industrialist versus tribal or indigenous people, is there a way to teach the hawk to be more like the dove so that everybody doesn't become extinct? Adapt first, mutate later. Well, from, from an evolutionary point of view, the, the right way, well, the, the, the quickest way to do that is to change the payoffs. Right. Mm -hmm. So if the payoffs and the penalties, so we use payoffs in both a plus and minus sense. So, you know, a payoff could be a, a negative one. Um, but if, if, if the injury costs for a hawk fighting go high enough, then the proportion of hawks goes down. So, so one way, I mean, suppose that um, you find that you can't appeal to people's good intentions or good nature but you still want to change the society and the behavior. Well, from an evolutionary point of view, if you can change the payoffs, mm -hmm. then you can change the behaviors. And so, so for example, I'll give you a, a really concrete example of how that, that works um, in, in everyday Western society now. Uh, we, we have built into us, from, from an evolutionary point of view, a revenge mechanism. This, is, this comes from before there was a police force before there was a government, um, if someone came and injured your child, raped your daughter, mm. killed your wife, a mechanism goes off in you that says, I am going to chase that person down and get revenge no matter what the cost to me, per it doesn't matter what the cost is to me personally. It's a, a doomsday machine that goes off on us. And this is part of human nature. Now, why from an evolutionary point of view would there be this doomsday machine? Mm -hmm. From an evolutionary point of view, again, it's, it's think about it game theoretically. If the potential intruder, mm -hmm. the thief or the murderer knows that if he does that to your daughter or your wife, he will forever have to look over his shoulder because you will never stop coming up. That is a credible credible threat that's going to make him think twice about doing that. If he knows that you're, you're blustering, that you won't actually come after him, mm. then, then the, the threat goes away. So it actually has to be real. It has to be a doomsday machine that you cannot control. So this, this is the evolutionary logic for why we find ourselves sometimes with emotions that, that are overwhelming and that, that dictate. So, so this leads, in, in cultures we see throughout history of a tit for tat kind of fighting that goes on in, in those cultures. Uh, you know, you killed my ancestors, now it's our turn. Now, now we're even, oh no, we're not even because you just killed my, you, you, so you, you, you never feel even. You're, there's always this revenge mechanism. So what, what, what do we do? Well, we haven't changed human nature, right? You, you can still feel this yourself. If someone, even if you're enlightened and you meditate, and so forth. If someone does something to your daughter, you're going to have to deal with these feelings of revenge. You may not act on them, but you will have them. And it will be a non-trivial thing for you to sit with them and let them go. That's not, it's not trivial. These are wired into us. Mm -hmm. So what do we do to avoid this kind of thing in Western society? We bring in Levi what they call Leviathan, the government, right? Mm -hmm. With, with a, a, a federal agents, a police force. And what we say is, look, if someone injures you, you are not allowed to take the law into your own hands. Mm. The law is 
given to an, in, an uninterested third party who, who doesn't really care either about you or the other person, but they care about the action. You, you're not allowed to murder. And so that takes out, that stops this revenge mechanism. We tell the person, if you engage in your revenge mechanism, uh, we will put you in prison too. <laughs> right? so, so, we so we're not changing people's psychology. The psychology is the same. We're changing the payoffs. And, and what that does is it breaks the cycle of revenge and then counter revenge and then revenge again. So that's how we, we, so that's a long answer to your question, but the way you think about it from an evolutionary point of view is changing human nature as, as anybody who meditates knows, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. We're talking about a lifelong, for, for most of us, it's a lifelong dealing with human nature and, you know, it, meditating and letting go of things and, and, and so forth. Um, if we don't want to wait and we want to stop the violence now, then we intervene by changing the, um, the payoffs. And so that's what we do in Western societies. That's what governments and police forces do. They change the payoffs. Um, they're not changing human nature. Um, human nature changes over longer and longer periods of, of time. I think we talked last time or a few times ago about how when we got agriculture, mm. have we talked about that? Um, I don't think we did actually. It's, I know that it's discussed in one of the articles about how when we were introduced to farming that we actually evolved as human beings that our microbiome had to evolve to, I think it was gonna be the next right. article in uh, niche construction that our microbiome actually had to evolve to be able to handle things like milk and carbohydrates. But I don't know if we per se uh, dived into that, Don. So, so this is a, a fascinating and counterintuitive implication of, of evolutionary theory. So in some sense, we were hunter-gatherers for hundreds of thousands of years. And about, you know, and we were, our brains, if you look at the, the volume of the cranium of our hominid ancestors, you could see them growing, growing, growing for millions of years until about 15,000 years ago. And by that point, we were so smart our ancestors were so smart and so robust, we invented agriculture. So we've been in small hunter-gatherer societies, but we invented agriculture. And all of a sudden we, we had the resources and the need for much bigger social units mm -hmm. because you, it takes a lot of people to stay in one place to do the crops. And if someone's doing the crops, well, other hunter-gatherers are gonna be coming in and marauding you, trying, I mean, you, you spent a year growing these crops it's a freebie for someone if they can just come in and kill you and take it. So now you need your own army and now you need people to you know, train the army. So you, you get a whole society that grows up because of um, agriculture. Well, what happens now is with agriculture, the selection pressures on the individual go way, way down because you have a social safety net. Before mm -hmm. as a hunter gatherer, you with just you know, a handful of your kin. And so you had to make all your own clothes hunt down your own stuff. You know, if you had an infection, you had to treat it yourself. You had to be robust, you had to be smart, you had to do it all yourself or die. I mean, you had to do that or die. But now, um, Joe over there, he's making my shoes. Mary, she's, she's helping make the, the, the bread that I eat. I don't have to do it all myself. You got a division of labor. So the selection pressures on the individuals uh, plummeted. And so as soon as you don't have the selection pressures on the individuals, people, that would normally have died because they were too weak or not sharp enough, they didn't die. They had kids. Mm. So what's gonna happen? Well, we're not gonna be as brawny and as bright. And what's happened over the last 15,000 years is our brain volume has dropped by the size of an entire tennis ball. We have lost a tennis ball of volume of brain in the last 15,000 years. So we took uh, an escalator up in brain size. In the last 15 years, we've taken the elevator down. What's unique about our species, perhaps, what's remarkable about us is that we're the species that's losing brain volume at the fastest rate of any species. We're also becoming much less robust physically because again, as hunter-gatherers, we had to be really tough or die. And, and you would die often before you could have kids. Well, well now someone like me, I'm not a big and tough guy. I'm, I'm pretty wimpy. I can have kids. Well, so that means, uh, you know, that if we looked at, if our ancestors from 15,000 years ago came and looked at us, we would look like dumb wimps. 
And, and so, so again, we see the very interesting effects, um, counterintuitive of evolution and, and the social pressures. And, and, and we can actually, by the way, before this was even um, discovered, I sort of knew that this had to be the case from evolutionary principles. It, was, it became clear just from evolutionary principles that this would be the case, but, but there are you know, paleoanthropologists who've actually done the measurements of the crania and um, John Hawks, for example, is, is one of them, who's actually done the measurements and, and this is what's going on. So one, once again, so, so evolution, some people think evolution is about always getting better and better and better and, and no, no, in fact, right now, I'll, I'll tell you one of the funniest examples from nature, um, it's the sea squirt. Um, as, as a juvenile, the sea squirt um, it's, it's a sea creature. It's got to swim and find a place that's going to be an ideal place for it to live. So it, it has a very sophisticated nervous system. It has to find a place that has enough water flow, but not too much, with enough nutrients, but not too much. And once it finds the right place, it attaches and it stays there forever. It never moves again because it's found the place. And so it no longer needs its brain. And so it eats it. And that's what evolution thinks about brains. If you don't need them, eat them. And and so, so again, the, the logic that comes out of this is very, very different than, than our, our normal intuitions about things. But, but then, so I'm, I'm just speaking again, and I should preface or, or just again say that what I'm saying, I'm not saying that evolution is the final theory or that is, is the deeply right theory. It's the best theory that we have so far that's mathematically precise and that makes testable predictions. I would love a new and deeper theory. We just don't have one yet. Um, so, so that's the spirit in which I'm putting this out there. I'm not, I'm not being, um, uh, you know, an advocate that's saying we we know the right answer. This is the final word. But I'm saying whatever ideas we have, they need to be no less than our current evolutionary theory. They can be deeper, but they shouldn't be any shallower. Beautiful, Don. Uh, Deepak, I know that we have a limited amount of time today. I would love for your closing thoughts, if you wouldn't mind, on what Don touched on. You know, we were talking about this idea of hawks and doves, industrialists and indigenous people. Going back to your earlier example, Deepak, in today's show of needing a certain amount, a certain amount of the population to be able to shift, you know, our own internal microbiome as well as our own internal consciousness. Do you have any suggestions as how we can do that as a society so that we begin to evolve back up the escalator instead of going down and can help one another for the greater good and just like the trees that help each other that we can begin to uplift and support one another with what we need rather than trying to knock each other down and out okay that's a long conversation Maybe <laughs> we can do it next time and uh, continue with that conversation but listening to dawn what he described is very elegantly mechanisms, you know, that occur uh, within, uh, uh, between species, you know, predator and uh, the hunted species, that the predator relationship with the prey. And uh, that is part of the food chain. What I would like to say is two things. So that's at the local level, it's happening. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, and, and I don't have a science for this, but, you know, I've always wondered as uh, somebody who is a biologist and a clinician, studied embryology, you know, when we start this life as a fertilized ovum, that's one cell. It divides approximately 50 times to create about 50 trillion cells, which is more than all the stars of the Milky Way galaxy. Each cell is differentiated from the original cell. Now we know, understand mechanisms for that. There are on-off switches, which are epigenetic switches that trigger the activity of certain genes and shut down the activity of other genes, but it's all correlated. So what is the organizing principle that makes one cell differentiate into all these cells, uh, underlying organizing principle that is doing that? That's a mystery right now, even though we know the mechanisms that the switches are being turned on and off. How does a human body Think thoughts, play piano, kill germs, remove toxins, make a baby all at the same time. Remove toxins, regulate blood pressure, autonomic nervous system, thoughts, feelings, emotions, embryogenesis. And meanwhile, your body is tracking the movement of stars and planets because your biological rhythms are actually a mirror of cosmic rhythms. 
whether they're um, circadian rhythms or seasonal rhythms or gravitational rhythms, even lunar rhythms. It's all like one symphony. We call it the universe, one song. Okay, so there is in evolution, I believe, an underlying principle of self-organization, self-evolution and self-regulation that applies to the entire ecosystem of life, entire ecosystem of life, from genes to plants to animals to bugs to bees to, you know, everything. I think there is an underlying principle. This is what we get from spiritual practice and understanding how my body right now is self-regulating. You know, also some scientists use the word autopoiesis, the cell knows how to regulate itself. We use these words in biology, self-regulation, homeostasis, um, autopoiesis, but we don't define usually what is the underlying principle. Now, having all said all that, I believe that humans are anomalies in nature. So, you know, some evolutionary bio biologists say that if we, if all the, uh, if all the insects disappeared from our planet and life would cease on our planet in five years. Same biologists I've spoken to say that if humans disappeared in five years, life would flourish on this planet. So this leads to another principle that a permanently victorious species risks its own extinction, which is what actually Don was suggesting, you know, that, you know, those hawks get so dominant, now they're risking their own. There's self-regulation going on there in the system, okay? But humans, we've beaten the system. We are permanently victorious. We've created technology that can cause climate change, extinction of species, mechanized ways of killing each other. And honestly, I think this may be the end of the evolutionary cycle as we know it. If there's a mass extinction due to human behavior, it could be climate change. It could be atomic war, it could be poison in the food chain. It could be extinction of all these species that we also have a relationship with. You know, right now humans consume five types of protein, chicken, pork, lamb, fish, eggs, maybe. But if you look at the genome, there are trillions of proteins out there, you know, that were part of the ecosystem. And yeah, I've talked to people who are thinking in terms of reinventing humanity, in terms of information technologies, energy systems, food production but also transport mechanisms, but also creation of matter instead of consumption of matter. This is radically different thinking and it requires a systemic mindset along with the mechanisms that Donald was speaking about because there are local mechanisms, but there's an overarching, I think, systemic evolution of ecosystems. And if we don't pay attention to that, we may be risking our extinction. That's all I have to say today. <laughs> Brilliant, Deepak. All that's but left is God, muted. Any last comments? You know, oh, I, I very much like that idea, Deepak. And and you know, so as a scientist, um, I don't take my current theories, our current theories, as the final word. They're, they're just what we can do rigorously so far. I would love to have a deeper theory that yes. incorporates the kind of ideas that you're talking about. That's mathematically precise. And I think that scientists should work to, to that end, to take the kinds of ideas you're talking about that we get from spiritual traditions. Can we get a deeper, precise theory of these things that might show how evolution by natural selection fits in as a special case, but not the whole case? This is very good what Don said, because you know, if you say mathematics and we think of mathematics as an intellectual activity that is looking at possible patterns of relationship right. in ecosystems, then we may have actually in new mathematics for what we will call systemic, holistic, uh, ecosystem-based uh, evolution. And that's in fact what I'm working on right now. There you are. So. Deepak, I'm waiting for your wisdom, my friend, on these incredible okay, episodes. So that, uh, the, <laughs> you know, again, I think we can call it conscious um, realism. Is there a new mathematic mathematics that would, that would, um, that would um, explain um, evolution of ecosystems. Hmm. Is that okay? It's okay. a question. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Okay, that's great. 
Thank you so much. Thanks, Donna. We'll meet next week. Okay, thanks. Happy birthday, Jennifer. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you.